At Gettysburg in 1863, 51,000 men were killed or injured in three days of battle. It was a fight between a conservative slaveholding South and a North determined to impose change. To one of the dead, Abraham Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address, the most important speech in American history. The Civil War reaches into our own age. The divisions it exposed are still part of the American political discourse. On these damp autumnal fields, in 229 brief, blistering words, Lincoln rededicated the American Republic to its original ideals. Fourscore and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. We here highly resolve, Lincoln said, that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. For him, the American Revolution was unfinished, what he called a work only thus far advanced. Well, 150 years on, it's still unfinished. Americans are still arguing about how to live the ideals that their republic is founded on, still bitterly divided about precisely what government of the people, by the people, for the people, should mean in practice. Subsequent presidents have come to Gettysburg to pay homage. It is uncanny that these two anniversaries should fall in the same week, for Gettysburg and John F. Kennedy are connected. Both presidents sought to use the power of federal government to force change on conservative states, both trying to force America to live up to its founding ideals as they saw them. Both made fierce enemies as a result. What the war was doing was preserving this unique system of democracy, of uh, Republican rule, you see. It's testing whether this can survive. And Kennedy, the parallel is, what does he speak of in his inaugural address and, and, and focus during his administration? It's the struggle for freedom, for liberty, to preserve the uh, democracy that we have here and around the globe. But black America was excluded from the Gettysburg Promise. The post-slavery South upheld racial segregation for a century. That century separates Lincoln from John F. Kennedy. And when Kennedy began to challenge white supremacy, the white South revolted. That revolt is what brought John Kennedy to Dallas that fateful day 50 years ago, when he drove past the Texas Book Depository. In the 1960 presidential election, Kennedy lost Dallas by the largest margin of any city in the United States, and he was not particularly popular here. Uh, mainstream conservatism had long been Dallas's reality, but uh, the activities of fringe right-wing extremists uh, really dominated the political atmosphere of the city at that time. The sixth floor of the book depository is now a museum. From here, you get the sniper's eye view. Kennedy was a year away from the 1964 election. He was here because he had to win Texas, but his supporters were deserting him. His challenge to white privilege had reawakened that old fault line in America, conservative fears of an overweening federal government. Right-wing extremists did not kill Kennedy, but his visit to Dallas to try to appease them did. It appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route, something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. There has been a shooting. Parkland Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. The presidential car coming up now. We know it's the presidential car. You can see Mrs. Kennedy's pink suit. There's a Secret Service man, Spread Eagle, over the top of the car. We understand Governor and Mrs. Connolly are in the car with President and Mrs. Kennedy. We can't see who has been hit, if anybody's been hit, but apparently something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong. At this point, it looks as though it could have been one or two or even all of the people within the car may have been the victims, may have been struck by shots. We don't know. It was definitely the president's car. The violent shock of it echoes down the decades even now. It's easy to forget that in life, Kennedy, like Lincoln, was a highly divisive figure. Both men perceived by conservative Southerners to be imposing an unwanted and alien Northern liberalism. They begin with lines such as, 
The first remark that I heard after hearing about the shooting of the president was, he asked for it. Another person said, why was he seeking admiration? Why wasn't he in Washington, where he belongs? This extraordinary collection of letters written to the mayor of Dallas in the days after the assassination is held by the de Gaulle Library in the city. They reveal the simmering intensity of public sentiment. What was the nature of the anti-Kennedy sentiment down here in the South? You know, I, I think it's, it's better to understand it less as anti-Kennedy sentiment than anti-Washington sentiment, anti-federal government sentiment. The two driving elements of American political history, going all the way back to the revolution, are how are we going to deal with race and what role government should play in telling individuals how to live their lives. This was the exact cause of the Civil War. It's the same argument that animates civil rights. Uh, throughout the 60s, and, and actually it's really one of the tensions I think that drives American politics today. Public sentiment still simmers in Dallas. At this Republican Party hustings, the outrageous growth of federal power under President Obama is a constant theme. Aren't you glad that we live in a state like Texas instead of like New York or California? Yeah. This is the latest manifestation of the long American argument. Today, it's about federal health care reforms, but it points to the same enduring themes, individual liberty and the illegitimacy of state intrusion. As the pendulum swings to a more statist point of view, where the government is in control, then we're, we're approaching a time of, of tyranny. You know, this is a really strong word. This is, the rest of the world sees this as the most securely entrenched democracy in history. And yet you use the word tyranny. Is it really that bad? I see what our government is doing in the redistribution of wealth that it is exercising as only perhaps semantically different than if I were to put a revolver at your head and tell you to give me your wallet. There's an unbroken line of continuity that runs from Gettysburg to Dallas and on into our own age. It's a struggle for ascendancy between two Americas, conservative America that seeks to champion the sovereignty of the individual citizen against the state, and another America that claims to speak for progress and seeks to harness the power of the state to impose it. It's an argument about what it means to be a true American. What it means to be a true American was the issue at Gettysburg. Who was embraced by the founding ideals and who was excluded? Does the politics of race still shape the country's discourse? Americans remain divided about what it really means to be a new nation conceived in liberty and how to advance that proposition that all men are created equal.